Welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by my partner in crime, your faithful host, Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing well. Thanks, Will. Hey, and this week, we have with us Judith Curry, um, who's a well-known figure in the field of climatology. She's a former professor and chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Curry is known for her research in climate science, particularly in the areas of hurricane, remote sensing, polar climates, and the uncertainties in climate modeling. She's been a notable figure in the public debate on climate change. She's known for criticism of the consensus approach to climate science and has expressed concerns over the political politicization, I'll get that word, of climate science and the challenges it poses for policymaking. Her views have made her somewhat of a controversial figure in the climate science community, as she often advocates for more nuanced discussion about uncertainties in climate science and the range of possible outcomes. So welcome to the show, Judith. Oh, well, thank you. I look forward yes. to our conversation. Yeah, so so we love nuanced discussions here on this on this show. Uh, but before before we get into any of those nuanced discussions, I, I I gotta know like what what is it that got you started in the field of climate science? It seems like something that uh, I don't know. Like when you grow up, it's not one of the like mainstays: astronaut, doctor, lawyer, whatever. Uh, so how did you become a climate scientist? Okay, you have to go back to fifth grade. And I, <laughs> and I was in this little group of students that were selected for special enrichment. And we had people from different professions come to talk with us. And one of the people who came to talk with us was a geologist. It was an elderly woman with a wooden leg. I remember her very vividly. Oh my God, that's okay. I remember her. Sorry, it's my doorbell. I don't need oh, to answer. It's, it's uh, okay. I so I remember her very vividly, and she was talking about the ice ages and how we knew all this and fossils. And oh my gosh, I was so hooked. Okay, and then for my um, <laughs> then for my next birthday with my birthday money, I used that money to go out and buy a book on geology, which I still have. Well, actually, I gave oh, wow. it. To granddaughter. So, so that's my oh, that's beginning. Great. And, you know, when I went to college, I was majoring broadly in earth sciences, but the course that hooked me was introduction to meteorology, which put me more on an atmospheric track. Okay. And so that's what I ended up specializing in atmospheric science. And my PhD thesis was on the topic of Arctic climate and weather. Okay, which became very relevant in the 1990s, you know, as the climate story heated up. So, so that's how I got into all this, you know, trace it back to fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that is awesome. Wow. Um, yeah, I wish I had somebody like that in fifth grade to kind of motivate, motivate me. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it's just another reminder of how important teachers are in the lives of, of people. So uh, we sure. are ver we're very pro teacher here. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so so the, the $10,000 question everybody um, wants to know is climate change real? Okay, that, that's sort of a yeah misleading question because the mm. climate has changed over the entire 4.6 billion of earth history mm. um, it's always changed it's changing now and it will change in the future so is climate mm. change real <laughs> i mean it's sort of like almost a tautology um, the issue is human caused climate change while well, humans influence climate in a number of ways um, first and foremost through land use uh, deforestation mm. agriculture culture, urbanization, all this kind of stuff, you know, we influence certainly our local climate. We also influence the composition of the atmosphere, not just carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases, but also small particulates, what you would commonly call air pollution, soot, things like mm. that. Okay, so, so we, we do influence the climate in that way. Is, I mean, the big question is whether human causes of climate change are dominating over natural causes. Okay, the UN would like you to think, yeah, it's all, everything that we've seen for the last couple of decades is all human caused climate change. 
Well, it most certainly is not. The natural cl climate variability is very important, including hmm. back from the sun, volcanic eruptions, but most importantly on decadal time scales is the large scale ocean oscillations that really dominate our regional weather and climate. So, I mean, that's really an open question just because the UN has manufactured a consensus around human caused climate change. That doesn't mean that that's what's really causing what we're seeing. So I got to ask, I got to ask, um, it wasn't just the UN, but what is the guy's name? I'm, I'm blanking on his name. The actor that was in Shutter Island and he was in Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, no, da Vinci. Leonardo. What is it? Leonardo da DiCaprio. 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 Yes, he cares too. And he's very convinced. And he wants me to know that climate change is um, real in the in, in, in the human induced way. Wendy, for Hollywood types to jump on yes. board, be sophisticated, and political, and righteous, and moral, but the guy doesn't have a clue. Have you ever seen a picture of his yacht? I mean, <laughs> I mean it, it's probably close to the size of the Titanic. It's huge. I mean, his fossil fossil fuel footprint is enormous. I mean, these clowns need to walk the walk. <laughs> any credibility at all yes thank you his one his one plane ride to paris gave more carbon emissions than my entire life so i don't care for those paris accords so anyway i'm just being i'm, I'm being kind of facetious but kind of tongue-in-cheek and, and true and all that and funny but i do have an actual legitimate question um like you said right that's interesting it, i've heard this before that the earth's climate has always changed. I'm not a meteorolo meteorologist. I'm not a climate scientist by any means. Don't even have uh, very much knowledge at all in that area. My expertise lies in other things. But when we're thinking about this question in how much historical context makes a difference, how much the current political climate makes as much a difference for climate change, I think, as anything else in terms of its reality or non-reality or whatever on the spectrum in people's minds that, that that's there. But how do we differentiate between natural variability in, in the weather and human induced changes? Like how, how, do, how can, how can someone say this is or is not caused okay. it's, by humans? Is that even an answerable question? The climate system is extremely complex, chaotic, nonlinear. It is not at all easy to separate out human causes from natural causes. I mean, we try to do it, but the data is never good enough, especially when you're going back further in time. Um, but one of the biggest arguments that people use to ramp up the alarm about this whole thing is that the warming is causing, you know, bad weather, hurricanes, heat waves, floods, droughts, forest fires, and on and on it goes. Well, in the US, if you look back at the 1930s, the weather was far and away much worse than it's been for the last two decades. We had the worst heat waves, the worst droughts, the worst forest fires, even the worst US land falling hurricanes. And that was natural variability. It had nothing to do with, CO2 emissions or anything like that. So it, it's very hard to separate out. And that there, there've been, the UN has assumed that the change is human cause. They've assumed that it's dangerous. And then they've said the scientists will find us support for all this so we can implement the policies that, you know, we want to implement anyways. So it, it's policy driven science is what we're dealing with here. I mean, real climate science with the fundamental geology and oceanography and atmospheric science. Yes, that's happening, but the people focused on that mostly stay out of the public discussion. And, um, you know, it's almost a, a separate field from what we now call climate studies. I wouldn't even dignify it with the word of climate science because there's not all that much science in there anymore. That's so interesting. Uh, I, I I love everything that that you've said so far because I it's it's I'm not a scientist um and 
most of my information I get, I try to get from people that actually know stuff like, like yourself. I mean, take COVID for instance, you know, I mean, there's beliefs all over the place. Um, and it's so hard to kind of figure out what's what, okay, do I get the shot? Do I not get the shot? You know, is it real? Is it not real? You know, and, and, uh, my, my oldest has a, uh, a, a number of medical issues. So I just, I just refer to, to his doctor. I'm like, Hey, like, Hey, what do I need to do to make sure our family's safe? And they say, okay, X, Y, or Z. And then I'm like, great, cool. Um, but, but I, I'm curious, like as a, as a whole, how do you think the public's understanding of climate change um, human and human, you know, caused or not, how, how do you think our understanding of climate change has evolved over the years? Well, the public doesn't understand very much at all. They just react to um, all this apocalyptic rhetoric, code red, existential threat, and all this kind of stuff. So the public doesn't understand very much at all. I mean, until all this human caused global warming came down the pike, you know, the climate variability. The climate varied and we worked to adapt to it and we, you know, we watched it. It was, you know, an act of God or whatever, something that we certainly didn't think we could control or even attempt to control, um, you know, so we just dealt with it. Okay, now with the hubris and the political agenda of the UN, they think we can control climate by getting rid of fossil fuels, which feeds into all sorts of their other political agendas. Um, you know, so it's it's a very ugly situation. And, um, you know, people can really ignore the whole thing in their day-to-day -day life. I mean, you know, we have good good weather and bad weather and, you know, we see it in the news and we always bounce back and, this, that, and the other, um, you know, so it doesn't really affect people's day-to-day -day life. You can function perfectly well with ignoring the whole issue. The problem is when our politicians are working to destroy our energy infrastructure, you know, kneecapping the fossil fuel companies before there's a viable alternative in place, and this stands to in reduce the reliability and abundance of our electricity, increase its costs, damage our economy, damage our national security, on and on it goes. Okay, so, so at this point, the, policy, the climate policies are a bigger threat than actual climate change itself. So that's, a, you know, that's where we are right now, and it's not a good place. Yeah. So, so a couple of times you, you've mentioned the, the UN. So I, I'd love to get your, your, uh, your thoughts about like, do you think the UN is, you know, kind of the largest organization that's pushing for a lot of, um, you know, climate change initiatives or is there, you know, like okay, the, this, the US? this is UN driven. You have to go back to the 1980s and the UN environmental program. Um, you know, the UN has always wanted to see non-governmental world control by agencies such as the UN, you know, to marginalize the national governments, pro-environmental, degrowth, anti-capitalist. I mean, you can see these threads, you know, in the UN throughout its history, really. So, so this is what they're looking for. And at this point, the Europeans are the only ones who seem to have really bought all this. Um, the U.S. goes hot and cold, depending on whether the Democrats or the Republicans are in power. Um, developing countries and, you know, India and China and whatever says, so, you know, well, yeah, we, we get that we probably need to transition from fossil fuels at some point by the end of the 21st century. And yeah, it would be great to have cleaner and more abundant energy, but we're not going to, you know, adopt the timetable of the UN. We're not going to, you know, we, we need coal, we need oil and gas. I mean, and until there's something better to replace it with, we're going to keep using it. Okay. And, you know, the, the countries that are trying to develop, um, you know, in the 1970s, Bangladesh was a complete basket case. And now they're doing really, really well because they did not follow the advice of the UN and the World Bank and all those important organizations. And they developed their own natural gas resources and use this to develop their economy and their industry. 
And now Vietnam and Cambodia are doing the same thing and they're doing it off of coal. Okay. And, and they're, they're actually developing some high tech industries are doing really well and they have the potential to really thrive, but not if, um, you know, you, you, you tell them they can't burn coal. I mean, that would just put the skids on the whole thing and they need to burn even more coal because they have a lot of hydropower, but China control, you know, the um, Mekong River that runs down there, China controls the headlands and it runs through China and they're damming it all up and they're going to be losing their hydropower. So they're becoming even increasingly reliant on coal. So, so what are we going to tell these countries? No, you can't develop. <laughs> you know, a lot of people in your country Good are luck. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just absolutely crazy. So it, it's, it's inhumane. It's, it's green colonialism. Um, you know, it's fine for Leonardo DiCaprio and all these UN officials to fly in their private jets all over the place, but there's no way that we can, I mean, I mean there's almost a billion people in Africa without access to grid electricity and they won't, the banks won't even lend Africa any money because we're not supposed to invest any further in oil and and coal plants. So we can't even loan them money for them to develop their own resources. But we'll come in, we'll let the big oil companies come in, mine your oil and ship it off to Europe and Asia. I mean, that's what's going on. I mean, I mean it's absolutely immoral. It's absolutely stupid. It's senseless all in the name of thinking that we can control the climate, which we can't. We influence the climate, but we certainly can't control it. And, you know, all in, and what's behind all this is these sort of UN values of degrowth, anti-capitalism and so on. I mean, so, so that's what's hmm. behind all this. And it's, it's evil. It's a worldview that most of the world does not subscribe to or, and does not want. So I, I tend to want to agree with you, but I don't have any means by which to compare what you're saying versus what Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio told me in the Netflix special okay. that he had. And, and well, I just... I, and and I, I absolutely want to hear your answer, but I just want to give it a little bit of context. So and what I mean is, besides the fact that you're a scientist, and so I'm going to trust your word on that issue more because of that, you know, because of what you have. But again, that could be considered a fallacy by some people just to trust something because it has authority as opposed to what's actually being said. So my question is... We got two different people that can use the same data and come to very different conclusions. So either they're not using the same data, one, they're ignoring some data, or, or, or there's some difference in the methodology that's making them come to do different conclusions. And maybe you have another option that I haven't thought of. I'm just okay. little, seriously trying to think through this. So what criteria... Can someone like me or Will use to determine the reliability and relevance of scientific data that's given? Like, how are we just lost to say, well, I guess the experts know. I, I guess our government will tell us they're, they're, they have my best interest at heart. My government always does. So they're going to tell me what well, uh, but, isn't that always been the case? Will, isn't the government always had your best interest at heart? Anyway, okay. sorry, well, I, I'm digressing. Go ahead, Judith. I want you to hear your answer. Out, you laid that out very well. And this challenge of disagreement, uncertainty, what the future might hold, scientific disagreement, um, ambiguity and values, you know, different societies, different individuals having different values. You know, so what are we supposed to make of this? Well, this is exactly why I wrote my new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Nice. Making our response. Okay, um, you can buy it on Amazon or wherever, but it talks about why do people disagree, um, how politics, has, how the science has become politicized, 
how we've manufactured a consensus that is way premature. Um, you know, this the, our scientific understanding doesn't in, um, support it. It explains how um, climate science is deeply, you know, the Earth's climate is a deeply complex system that we're only scratching the surface of our understanding. There are all sorts of uncertainties, a lot of things that we don't know and a lot of things that we can't know. Okay, so, you know, w once you acknowledge that, okay, they just say, now what? Should we just forget about the whole thing? Well, no. I mean, if, if you apply 21st century risk science to this uh, with principles of robust decision-making, decision-making under deep uncertainty, there's lots of different frameworks that can, you can use to you know, analyze the risks, understand the uncertainties, deal with the conflicting values, and you know, so you can make headway on improving human well-being. And you know, if you apply those risk science ideas, what you're doing is carving off human-sized problems, like how to pre you know, better manage water resources in California so we don't have a flood or drought situation. Can't we have reservoirs and manage the floods and desalination and really get this water situation sorted out in a sensible way? Things like that. That's a human-sized problem that everybody can agree on. Oh, this would be beneficial. Okay, let's work on that. But this top-down UN approach that requires a dismantling of global energy infrastructure and restricts developing countries from using their own fossil fuel resources. That is very, very <laughs> bad from a risk management perspective because we're gonna end up worse off. Because if we have wealth and if we have electricity, these are the resources we need to protect ourselves from extreme weather and climate events you know, with our dams and our reservoirs and our desalination plants and our coastal infrastructure and on and on it goes. Um, this is how we protect ourselves is with electricity and wealth. And if we start destroying our electricity and wealth, we're going to be far more vulnerable to whatever mother nature might throw at us. So, so this is sort of <laughs> the take um, in my book. But yeah, of course, people just, there's a lot of scientific uncertainty. You can put somebody with my credentials um, in a debate with me, and we'll be debating, you know, opposite sides of the whole thing. So it's not just a matter of, you know, who's an expert and who's not. You've got experts disagreeing all over the place. And, you know, and, and there's a lot of hidden values, and there's a lot of hidden assumptions in this whole UN thing that are are buried deep down, um, you know, moral assumptions and things like that. And, you know, we need to get all this stuff out in the open and think more deeply. And this isn't a problem just for what I would call scientific expert. It's uh, an issue for everybody, you know, who lives on this planet, who wants to thrive um, and who wants to protect themselves from extreme weather and climate events. So it's an issue for everybody. It's not just the purview of the so-called um, scientific experts. And so this is what I'm trying to open up the scientific debate, open up the policy debate to a much broader group of people and you know, with a much broader range of solutions to consider. So this is what I put forward in my book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Um, and you know, it, it, it's selling well, it's been translated into mm -hmm. German now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm doing a lot of podcasts in Europe, they're interested. Okay, but the, the thing that really strikes me is that the other side, the alarmist, nobody has come after the book yet. You know, there hasn't been a takedown review or anything like that. I mean, they're ignoring it. I mean, it's a hard book to counter <laughs> because, you know, I give airtime to both sides of this and say, look, we disagree, <laughs> you know, let's acknowledge it. Now, what do we do? So it's a little bit of a difficult book to trash 
and dismiss. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we'll, we'll see what the next year holds, you know, whether the, <laughs> the climate establishment is going to come out and trash this book, but they haven't yet. Yeah. So, That's great. I'm hoping it's giving everybody food for thought mm -hmm. in terms of how we think about this deeply complex and challenging issue. Yeah. You, you know, there's this, there's a show on Apple TV called, uh, extrapolations and, um, it's, it's a, it's a really good, good show, but it's all about the, it's all about the climate and they don't necessarily focus so much on, you know, fossil fuels are bad or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but they, they, they do it kind of from the standpoint of almost like politi politicizing the um you know the catastrophe like so so the 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 way the show goes is like it's every episode is spaced like 50 years further into the future than the next and and uh one of the things that they they show in there is like people profiting off of you know all of the chaos that's that's caused from the the climate and and you've alluded to that quite a bit actually about the politics and i i i'd love to kind of you know, get your, your take about, you know, like who, who's benefiting politically from, from this, this fight, um, about, you know, human caused climate change or, or, or whatnot. And like, how do you, how do you even like combat that? Okay. Well, part two of my book talks about, you know, what might the rest of the 21st century hold? in terms of weather and climate and pop, yeah, economics and whatever. I try to use a crystal ball and we don't know, but you can lay out some scenarios and put forward a broad range of scenarios. But by any measure, we will be better off by 2100 than we are now. Okay, economically, the, the economist estimate, even if we continue burning fossil fuels at the present rate, that will be four to 500% better off economically than we are now. Um, and if, if we were to get rid of fossil fuels and solve the climate change problem, you know, we'd maybe increase that by, you know, 20%. But it's, you know, it's not, nobody is talking about some sort of Mad Max scenario where we're worse off than we are now. Okay, that this is the dirty little secret. And this is even according to the IPCC and the IPCC economic scenario. This is not something that a climate skeptic is making up. If you read the fine print, I mean, this is what, this is what they say. Um, so exactly what are we worrying about? Um, the weakest part of their argument is whether warming is dangerous. I mean, the slow creep of warming is not dangerous. Um, you know, in geologic and human history, they prefer, they refer to the warm period as optimums, <laughs> okay, climate optimums, where everybody, you know, the ecosystems flourish and, you know, it's, it's easy for humans. Why we think warming is dangerous now, I just don't know. So, okay, so who's making money off of this? Well, once government okay, there's a worldview, you know, this sort of degrowth, anti-capitalist, yada, yada worldview. And once governments start spending money along those lines, then people figure out how to make money. Okay, Warren Buffett invested big in wind, not because he thought wind energy was a good idea, but he wanted to take advantage of all those subsidies. Hey, I'm going to make money off of this. Okay, so, so people figure out, you know, how to make money off of it. Um, you know, you, you know, it's big business in journalism hmm. and all these advocacy groups and a lot of billionaires are just throwing money at this, you know, into journalism and these, you know, green kind of think tank advocacy hmm. groups, huge amount of money, just stop oil and extinction rebellion. There's Rockefeller money, there's Kennedy money, um, there's J. Paul Getty's fortune is funding all this stuff. I, I mean, it's just nuts. Um, you know, people just have different worldviews. You know, there's one worldview that thinks the environment is fragile and most important and that humans are a blight on the environment. 
And there's another group say, okay, well, let's put humans first. How can humans thrive? Sure, we, we can't thrive by totally trashing our environment, but let's figure out how we can optimally use our resources, engineer our environment, and let's see how well we can do. I mean, these are two different worldviews. And, you know, what psychology or cultural factors come into play, you know, that contributes to these worldviews? I mean, that one's beyond me, but there's these two worldviews out there. So, so, so once governments start making these policies, then people figure out how to make money off of it. So it's um, yeah. So, it's so I cynical. I, yeah, I have a I have a friend. Actually, I have a couple friends who who think that um, uh, lasers from space are burning up large areas of. The United States, Canada, stuff like that, um, all in the name of um, pushing the the climate agenda. And I don't know if you've heard any of, any of these um, conspiracies, or at least I think they're conspiracies. I, if well, you tell I, me that, I, 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 I really don't pay attention to that stuff. So I'm the wrong person to ask. Okay. Them. Okay. I mean, good. Good. Yeah, but good. in the absence, you know, and and and, and because <laughs> of the politicization of science, okay. The general public doesn't trust scientists anymore. They don't distrust, they distrust expert yeah. authorities and it makes them a lot more susceptible to conspiracy theories. Okay, so we've and done this ourselves. Allow, yeah, allowing the science to be politicized has brought us to, has sort of um, fertilized all these conspiracy theories. Mm. I mean, I, I can definitely understand what you're saying. So how can we, I want to think about policy for a second, because right, a lot of this goes down to this scientist said this, these, uh, but what comes down to it, a lot of what you said is what gets funding and then what gets funding by government and what moves from funding to some kind of government exper you know, experiment in a sense of their funding, scientific efforts, and then they're finding out the data that they need to find out. And then, and then it's getting communicated to Congress or to the president or to whomever so that legislation can be made. What do you think is the balance? How can we balance between our immediate needs that we have and the long-term sustainability and climate policy like are there any principles that would help policymakers in balancing which what i'm hearing from you is an inherently it's an inherently uncertain aspect of this world that we have to essentially conjecture based off some data and assumptions we have not that it's just like you know made up or anything but we have to conjecture and, and, and make these kinds of predictions that then drive policy. What, what are some ways well, we can balance that? But, well, well, the first thing we need to do is to couple energy policy from climate policy. First off, there is no way we can control the climate. So thinking with that, we're gonna control the climate by eliminating fossil fuels, you know, is a joke. If there was any impact of getting rid of fossil fuels on the climate, we wouldn't notice it until the 22nd century. I mean, this is sort of generally accepted. I mean, if you read the fine print, uh, you know, this is generally accepted. So, you know, let's figure out what we should do about energy policy in the 21st century. Um, you know, fossil fuels aren't finite. There's issues, they pollute. Um, both in their burning and their resource extraction. There's geopolitical issues. A lot of the countries with good fossil fuel uh, resources are nasty countries that we don't want to do business with. So it makes sense to, you know, if it weren't for this climate issue, we would probably be starting to move away from fossil fuels over the course of the 21st century. You know, it'd be a natural evolution as better technologies and clean air becomes more of a priority. You know, actually, air pollution from fossil fuel plants is the main reason that China and India are even at the table. I mean, their their air quality is really bad from burning coal. Um, China's cleaned it up a lot. Um, 
but India is now in the stage where they're air. You just choke on the air in India because they're burning so much coal. So, you know, clean up the environment. You know, we want something cleaner so we don't have all this air and water pollution. I mean, we're going to need, and people don't realize, you know, if we're going to progress, if, if humans are, are going to advance in the 21st century, we're going to need orders of magnitude, more electricity, um, not just to electrify Africa and things like that, but for artificial intelligence and blockchain and robotics and data data centers and on and on it goes. You know, the computers are using just a few percent of our electricity right now, but they're talking about in the next decade, it's going to be 20% of our total electricity use. And I think that's going to skyrocket. So we need a lot more energy than what we have now. Wind and solar are not the solution for so many reasons. I don't want to waste time here on it, but, you know, nuclear power, uh, you know, the, the new generation of nuclear power plants are just wonderful. I mean, let's, I mean, when I look at the year 2100, I mean, what do I see? I don't see wind turbines. You know, I see nuclear power, some geothermal, maybe some technologies we haven't thought about. And rooftop solar. I think there is some upside for rooftop solar, but I sure as heck don't see wind turbines and transmission lines crisscrossing the continents. I mean, it, we're looking at more local production of energy, which is um, more efficient and less of a blight on the environment. Um, so the, the first thing to do is just decouple the energy policy from climate policy. I mean, climate policy, I'm not sure we need a separate climate policy. I mean, we should clean up the pollution. We should you know, manage our land use so we can protect ecosystems. Neither of those things have anything to do with the climate. They just have to do with good stewardship of the planet, okay? And, and so, frankly, I don't think once you separate out ecosystem health, air pollution, and energy policy, and detach those from the climate issue. <laughs> There's really nothing left for climate policy. Um, you know, acknowledge we're not going to keep, you know, burning fossil fuels into the 22nd century. Sure, we'll be using them for industrial purposes and materials and things like that. But I'd be very surprised if we're actually burning fossil fuels in the 21st century. So, you know, so just let them let it take its course, let the market do its thing. You know, the government can provide incentives in the right directions. I mean, all this money that's gone into wind turbines and solar farms that is just wasted. I mean, it's a blight on the environment and it's just not going to work. So we, we've just wasted a lot of money and we've slowed down the 21st century energy transition by thinking that wind and solar is going to work. It's not. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so within your scientific community, um, like, are there others that share like your same view, um, you know, about, yeah. oh, okay. Um, yeah. and, and it, cause, cause uh, you know, and <laughs> the ones get, that get canceled and called deniers, <laughs> are the ones that criticize the climate establishment like me. Mm. Okay, th 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 this is the the big sin. You know, I broke the fatwa by criticizing the IPCC, criticizing the people involved in climate gate, criticizing activist climate scientists. Th this is why, you know, I've been excommunicated. But there are other scientists who play the game to some extent, who, you know, would agree pretty much with what I say, but they don't criticize the climate establishment if they will, if you will. Hmm. So um, yeah, there's a lot of people who agree with me. Um, Got it. That, that, I mean, uh, number one, I, I apologize. I mean, I don't think I had anything to do with it, but you know, I, I definitely sympathize for, for people that have been somewhat excommunicated for thinking differently, um, you know, as a, Progressive Democrat, um, I've drinking the Kool Aid, you know, tree hugger, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't drive a um, electric car or anything like that. But um, uh, 
but I, I have friends, uh, very, very liberal friends that have chosen not to have kids because they were afraid of the world they are going to raise their, their kids in, you know, thinking that, you know, there's just going to be like plumes of smoke just right outside their door and everybody wearing respirators um, all, all day. Um, and based on what I'm hearing from you, that's not really a, a concern or, or is something that Americans should really be concerned about. Is that right? No, p- people need to just sort of stop listening to this apocalyptic rhetoric. Do some homework. The more you understand, the less alarmed you're going to be. You hmm. know, do your homework. You can start by reading my book, um, but there's a <laughs> lot of other good books out there. Um, you know, educate yourself and develop a sense of optimism about our future and go on and live your best life. I mean, this is, I mean, the the psychological damage that all this has done is enormous, especially to like uh, young adults and even kids. I mean, it's just all in the interest of trying to scare people into becoming activists and developing the political will to get rid of fossil fuels. Well, how's that working for you so far? Not very well. I mean, we're still, the world is still getting about 82% of its electricity from fossil fuels. And that's maybe budged one or 2% since all of, since all of this has started. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me because it feels like it's like the Western world has built, been built on this energy of fossil fuels. And now that we're at this advanced stage, it's like we're looking at the underdeveloped world and we're like, no, we don't, you're not allowed to do the same thing we did. (laughs) You do the same thing we did, then we're all screwed. So you're not, oh, that's what they say. But I hear you saying something different. I say they, I mean, you know, that kind of, uh, that kind of narrative that you should hear well, what what kind of ethical considerations are at the center of this um, issue you know, because each side is claiming the moral high ground well okay what are the ethical issues at stake here okay uh, uh in defense of africa and whatever i mean what they're doing to africa and other undeveloped i mean it's energy apartheid and green colonialism is absolutely immoral um The people on the other side, well, all of this is irrelevant if we don't even have a planet, you know, existential risk. But the climate crisis isn't what it used to be. I mean, the most important thing that's happened in the last couple of years is the UN has now dropped the extreme emission scenario um, from consideration where we were going to see eight to 10 degrees Fahrenheit of warming by 2100. You know, that if that was going to happen, you know, that trumps a lot of stuff. But um, the UN has now backed off. They, they finally understand that these extreme emission scenarios are implausible. They require us to be burning six times more coal than we are currently. I mean, things that totally don't make sense. Okay, so, so now we're talking about a warming that's maybe four to five degrees Fahrenheit, but this is measured since pre-industrial periods. And we've already warmed, okay, by say three degrees. And we're talking about another degree or two warming over the course of the 21st century. And this is definitely not something to worry about. You know, warming eight to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, that was something to worry about. But now just warming another to maybe three degrees Fahrenheit over the rest of the 21st century. This is not something to worry about. It's something we can easily adapt. I mean, look, we, we've already had like, over the last hundred years, we've already seen, you know, over two degrees Fahrenheit of warming. And over that period, the Earth's population has exploded. Far fewer people are living in poverty. We're seven times wealthier than we were a um, hundred years ago. Um, there's far fewer lives per million people uh, lost from extreme weather and climate events, two orders of magnitude fewer decrease. 
in the last hundred years, agricultural productivity and yields have skyrocketed. By any measure, we're doing really well. And we've made all this progress, you know, while it was warming, you know, over two degrees Fahrenheit. And so we're expecting another two degrees. So, you know, let's just get on with it and, you know, keep thriving, <laughs> which of course we can't do if they wipe out our electric utility system. Yeah. So, so what about like, I read an article a couple of weeks ago, um, talked about there's like this block of ice that's now traveling in the ocean or something like that, that broke off. I forgot on which pole, but. Um... Okay. What's an Antarctic ice sheet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if there's anything bad that's going to happen, I think collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet would be up there at the top. Now, the West Antarctic, it's an unstable ice sheet. If you took away all the ice, the continent that it's resting on would be underwater. So it's called a marine ice sheet and it's very unstable and it, and it moves fast. So, you know, icebergs are going to break off all the time and they always have been. During the last interglacial, like 119,000 years ago, the West Antarctic ice sheet was smaller than it is now. It didn't collapse. But if the West Antarctic ice sheet were to collapse, it's more likely or at least partially, it's more likely to be associated with geologic processes than um, global warming. There's all sorts of volcanoes underneath the ice sheet, including a few active ones. So there's a big heat flux coming in at the bottom of that ice sheet, which adds to its instability. So, I mean, yeah, that's the worst case scenario of something that could be happen. But there's no, if something bad wants to happen to the West Antarctic ice sheet, there's no way we're going to be preventing it by uh, getting rid of fossil fuels. Hmm, that's interesting. So, like, we have these articles that come out, like Will's referring to, you know, and that's basically the only way that he and I through those articles can gain access to what seems like the inscrutable world of climate science, right? The idea, like even we've alluded to it, even in this conversation, the idea of the experts, as long as we can keep them, like as long as they can't read it, actually that was one of the strategies of the uh, Catholic church at one time is that, Hey, we can't let the people read the Bible. Um, it has to be in the hands of the elite so that it can be used for control. And um, and that's, I mean, it's, it makes sense. A lot of people have done that. It's a very powerful book. And in any scripture has been used, uh, Quran and any other scriptures have been used in the same kind of way. So when I'm thinking about the, you know, we only have this access, right? And so we're looking at this stuff. But this is a constantly changing, fluxing discipline. People are learning, building, right? You have paradigm shifts um, where you think of the how science often will shift paradigms, Copernican revolutions, uh, the Einsteinian relativity rev, you know, revolution, and all these different, I'm forgetting the the philosopher that wrote the book on the on scientific revolutions, but I'll, I'll have to find it. I'll, I'll mention it in another podcast. But what do you think, like you, you have this understanding of this discipline, what are the emerging areas in climate science? Oh, like uh, what in the next, yeah, in the next like maybe couple decades, where do you see this going in, in kind of what are some macro trends that you see that you think that people like Will and I should be aware of? Well, I can talk about the biggest and most important uncertainties that people should be addressing. I don't know if we're going to make a huge amount of progress in the coming decade. Please do. The, the first one is cloudiness and how clouds vary with, with climate. This is the biggest uncertainty in the climate modeling enterprise right now is how clouds are going to change with warming, you know, both the latitudinal distribution, high clouds, low clouds, you know, all, all, all of these things. That's the biggest uncertainty right now and has been for many decades. So progress is being made, you know, but it's slow. Uh, the other, another big deal is the so-called solar effects on climate. 
you just think about the heating from the sun. I mean, that's obviously a driver, but there's also a number of indirect solar effects that also influence the climate. And these are poorly understood and not included in the climate models. We need to really do more work on the role of the sun in climate. That's a big deal. Um, we need better understanding of the large scale ocean circulations, particularly their multi-decadal to thousand year kind of variations and patterns and the dance between the dish, different ocean basins. This is hugely important. The climate models don't predict this well at all. Um, we need better understanding of the ocean carbon cycle, how the ocean uptakes and disposes with carbon and how it releases. We don't have a good quantitative understanding of the ocean carbon cycle. We don't have a good understanding of how the oceans transport heat vertically. Um, so, so we're getting some basic thermodynamics, dynamic interactions of the oceans wrong. I mean, th these are the big ones that immediately leap to mind, but to think that we can, that we have, that we can understand what's caused the recent warming, given that we don't understand all that, or that we can predict into the 21st century with any confidence, with all these fundamental uncertainties in our understanding. I mean, that's just, I mean, it's just not there. there there's all, the UN climate assessment is way overconfidence in its conclusions. You know, I I came across your work as as a result of a uh, um, a friend of mine posted something on social media. It was like it was a meme. It and it had like a picture of Greta Thunberg. I think that's her name. Um, <laughs> and 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 it and it's like I forgot. You Greta's know, your I, favorite, right? Yeah, yeah. Like she, she's my idol, and um, it was like you know, nineteen year old, no experience in climate scientists you know, thinks it's going to ruin the world. And then uh, Judith Curry, you know, lifelong climate scientist uh, says it's like no biggie. Um, and, uh, and I know that that folks kind of on, on my side of the aisle tend to really latch on to any sort of climate activist um, because it makes us feel good, right? It makes us feel like we're doing something, we're saving the world, we're saving other people, uh, makes us feel kind of righteous. Um, on the flip side, you know, I would say, you know, a lot of people in, in Josh's um, political arena are just like, you know, burn, baby, burn, you know, forget about what Greta says, you know, and, 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 I, and I don't necessarily think that both, you know, both examples that I gave are necessarily healthy for our discourse. So I, I, I'd love to kind of get your take on like, what's the middle um, for us to, to be thinking about, you know, climate scientists? <laughs> Me, my book. Um, there's nothing <laughs> out there. Um, I'm working on a new blog post. I have a blog called Climate Etc. JudithCurry.com. I'm working on a a blog post. You know, climate bookshelf for 2023, describing some notable books. You know, that are good for a general audience that were published in 2023. So, so this will give you, you know, additional resources. But there's, um. Yeah, this misplaced morality, you know, we're saving the planet, but we have to um, <laughs> keep, you know, the African continent mired in poverty and disease and everything else to accomplish this, you know, come on. Uh, I mean, you know, morality has been turned upside down. Um, you know, we're putting our great grandchildren we're prioritizing them over, we're pr prioritizing the well being of current people over something that's really uncertain. I mean, you know, we have no idea, you know, what people in 2100, what their values are going to be. And, you know, we have what we have now will be of very little value to them other than our ideas, our art. Um, you know, some infrastructure, but most of what we have now won't be of value to them in 2100. So, so, you know, we need to stop prioritizing the people in 2100 over the people living now, okay, in poverty. Um, that doesn't mean that the oil companies can just go rape the environment. I mean, they, they need to 
really be more environmentally conscious and they need to, you know, reduce the methane emissions and, you know, there's various things that they can do um, to be more environmentally sound. But until the demand disappears for oil and gas and coal, we should not be kneecapping those producers because we need it. Okay, when something better comes along or gas become, you know, oil and gas become too expensive to extract to compete with other sources of fossil fuels, I mean, we're still going to be using it. So we just need to get over it, figure out how to make it as clean as possible and do research and development for better, you know, energy technologies as we should. I mean, in 22 in the 22nd century, we're not going to be burning fossil fuels for electricity. I mean, I just can't believe that we would be doing it. We will have better solutions. Let's figure out how we get from here to there while allowing the world population to continue to thrive and develop. So that's that's awesome. I really appreciate you sharing all that. This is actually going to be the last kind of uh, deeper question, and then I'll have a last just kind of housekeeping question on how people can uh, keep up with your work. But so if we have a pretty diverse audience religiously and, and politically from atheists to strong Christians to Muslims and Hindus and various, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Satanists now. So absolutely got a diverse audience there. And also politically, from very conservative to very liberal, what's your what do you, what do you want them to hear from your heart as to like what what's the most important thing you want them to take away from today, and and how do you think maybe they should approach this issue of climate change in the future, especially coming in this next election season, where there's going to be a lot. Of rhetoric well, around it. We need to approach the whole issue with humility. We need to acknowledge that it's extremely complex. We don't understand. And that there's a lot of different values in play. We, we need to um, just acknowledge that from the outset. And then that puts us in a mindset for trying to, you know, identify some human size problems that we can actually solve you know, and, and make humans better off. I mean, we, we need to grow our wealth. We need to allow or, or support Africa and the other underdeveloped countries in their um, efforts to develop and to have a better life. And we have to, you know, try to reduce our vulnerability to extreme weather and climate events and other natural hazards. I mean, there's a lot of other hazards out there, not just weather related ones. I mean, th th this is how we can, and, and we need to, you know, try to keep the environment, you know, minimize our footprint on the environment, reduce, you know, traditional pollution and really support ecosystems, the old fashioned environmentalism, not the mm. new founded, just stop oil kind of environmentalism. Um, so, I mean, it, and it's, you know, that there's no big insights here, but it's just sort of what we were doing you know, 30 years ago, how we viewed the mm. world. And then we got derailed by this crazy climate change thing and the degrowth and anti-capitalist agenda and all this kind of stuff. We got sidetracked. So so we need to return to our values. And, you know, it's, there's some amazing opportunities in the 21st century for humans to develop and thrive, you know, and so let's go for it. Um, yeah. You know, so, yeah, we don't, we should not, we, we need to really, if you're afraid um, because of all the apocalyptic rhetoric you're hearing, then you just really need to educate yourself better about the whole thing. Um, but once we decouple energy policy from climate change, if we can accomplish that, then, then this whole, you know, all, a lot of this angst will go away. And that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, how can people keep up with your work and how can they figure out what's going on next? What projects do you have coming up? Okay. Well, you can follow me on Twitter 
at curry j a c u r r y j a i have a blog called climate etc judithcurry.com and my new book is climate uncertainty and risk which you can purchase from amazon barnes and noble and wherever so i look forward to continuing a dialogue with any of you that might be interested in following me on Twitter or participating in my blog. I really appreciate the opportunity to engage with you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. uh, Dr. Curry for coming on. It's been such a pleasure and thank you. Okay. And to our listeners, you're welcome. And to our listeners and watchers until next time, keep your conversations, excuse me, not left or right, but up. He's like, I hit that dude. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that was good. We'll keep that in there as uh, as one of the yeah you know, uh, outtakes. Bloopers. All right. All right. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Let's see you.